Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here in a mini series on the power of prayer. This is part three. In this video, we'll be looking at verse 131 of chapter 17 out of the third testament of the Bible. Now you can find a link to the third testament of the Bible in the description, both an audio version and a PDF that you can download to your device. So if you haven't done so already, go over and check out the first two parts of this series. In this part of the series, we're going to look at verse 131 from chapter 17 of the Third Testament of the Bible. But then we're going to jump over to Luke in chapter 11 and look at the Lord's Prayer in detail on verse by verse, line by line. And we're going to talk in detail about how it is and what it is that we are supposed to pray. Let's look at verse 131. He says, learn to pray for with prayer, you may do much good just as you may defend against threats. So it is necessary that we learn to pray. Like we said in the other two parts, even though I have been considered a Bible expert by many, I didn't know how to pray. And my conscience was letting me know because after I would say my prayers, I would have a feeling that I wasn't doing it right. What was I doing wrong? I was saying stuff like Lord and God instead of our Father or our Creator. Let's jump over and take a look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 when the Messiah told us how to pray. He was giving us an example of how to pray that many of us take for granted. Even though he told us how to pray, using the phrase, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, we still use words like Lord and God, which are titles. They're not names. They don't identify anybody at all. Anybody could be your Lord and anything can be a God. So if we want to have an effective prayer, we have to follow the footsteps of the Messiah and start off our prayers in that manner every time. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then pray what it is that you want or what it is that you need or whatever it is that you need for somebody else. And we also have to learn to pray silently. An effective prayer is a silent prayer. This is spirit to spirit communication with our Father. There's no need to talk out loud. And a verbal prayer is considered to be a materialistic prayer or a vain prayer. Like we said, we've given many, many classes on our channel on how to pray. It's probably one of the most important things that we teach on our channel as it is our only weapon going into the great tribulation. But let's go on. He says, prayer is both a shield and a sword. If you have enemies, you may defend yourselves with prayer. Prayer is both our shield and a sword. It is both our defensive weapon and our offensive weapon. We have to understand that we are at war. Sure, it's the early parts of the war and we haven't taken many casualties yet. But you remember when Revelation says that there will be a war against those that keep the commandments. At some point, these, the battles will become personal. So we have to understand the power of prayer and how to pray before that battle starts. Because like it says here, it is both our shield and our weapon. Our guns will not protect us. Our knives are not going to help us. Our money is going to fail us. Every other thing that we depend on is going to prove itself ineffective in the tribulation. As the flood waters start to rise, those flood waters of hate and greed and the other passions, we can defend ourselves against those with prayer. We can defend ourselves against any enemy with prayer. 
but know that this weapon must never wound or injure anyone. Sure it is a weapon, but we have to do so through love. We can't do so trying to harm anyone. If we try to pray for someone else to be harmed, it will backfire on us. Even when our enemies try to do something to harm us, we have to pray for their good. For its only purpose is to shine in the darkness. That's what prayer is, to shine in the darkness. We can't fight hate with hate. Well, we can't pray hate either. But by praying love, we set the example for the rest of the world. And as that light shines in the darkness, many will be attracted to it. We don't want to be the only ones that survive the tribulation. There's going to be a lot of work to do, and we want others around to help us. So the gist of that verse is to learn how to pray. So let's jump over and look in the book of the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 11, at the Lord's Prayer, and let's break down some of the key elements to prayer. I've said it before, and I will keep saying it. The reason why so many prayers are going unanswered these days is because we're simply doing it wrong. So let's go back to the basics. And let's look at how the Messiah taught us how to pray. So let's start right here at verse 2 and let's break this down. Now this is the Messiah talking to his disciples whom we all are or at least want to be. He says when ye pray say our father which art in heaven. Let's jump over to the third testament of the Bible chapter 17 and verse 44. He says, I taught you the powerful, masterly word, that which truly brings the child closer to his father, upon pronouncing with respect and sincerity, with elevation and love, with faith and hope, the word father. We have to use the word father in the beginning of our prayer. We learn in other places in the scripture that by using the word Father in our prayers, we actually open up communication pathways so that our communications can be heard in the spirit world. He says this word is powerful, a masterly word, which truly brings the child closer to the Father. See, you have to understand that He is our Father. Now, we all have daddies out here. We all have our individual daddies out here whom we all look alike. But we only have one father. He is the father of our spirits. He is the universal father. So when we can address him as father and use that in our prayers, look what happens. He says, distances disappear and spaces are shortened. For in that instant of spirit-to-spirit -spirit communication, nor is God far from you, nor are you far from Him. That is how we make the connection between our Father and us is by using the word Father in our prayers and opening them up in that manner. Let's jump back over here to St. Luke. And look what else the Messiah said in regards to how we are to pray. You see right there where it says, hallowed be thy name. That's mentioned again over here in verse 44 when it says, with respect and sincerity. We're showing reverence when we speak in this manner, saying, our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But let's go further and break down some of the other elements in this prayer here. For instance, it says right here, thy kingdom come. This is talking about the kingdom of heaven. We talk about in several of our classes how the father is not the king of the earth at this time. Satan is the king of this planet. 
You remember when he took the Messiah up on the mountain there, he reminded him of that when he told him that he can give him charge of the planet if he wanted to. Satan has always ran the planet all the way back to when Eve and Adam colluded with him in the Garden of Eden and ate from the tree of knowledge. But there's coming a day when the Father, the creator of the heavens and the earth, will be the king of the planet. So when you pray in this manner, you're actually asking for that day to come now. And it can. We can all take advantage of his kingship now. Sure, the entire world will have to wait till the day that he takes the reins over the planet, but he can be our king today. All we have to do is be obedient to him, show him the same respect and sovereignty that we will show any earthly king, and he will be our king. So that's what we're praying for, that we will become his subjects. Then it says, Thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. This is an important part to our prayer, praying for his will. We should pray for his will every day. We see here in chapter 77 and verse 49, it says, That is why the master taught you in the second era to say, Father, your will be done. For the father knows better than any of his children what the spirit needs. So us as humans may think we know what's in our best interest. But we have to remember that he knows what's best for us and the best thing to do most of the time, if not all of the time, is to pray for his will to be done in our lives. So in my daily prayers, I ask for his will to be done, but I even go on further to ask that if I am to have to suffer any troubles or hardships throughout my day, that he will give me the strength to overcome them and allow me to gain the knowledge and wisdom I need from those troubles so that I don't have to go through them again. But let's go on. Verse 3 says, To give us day by day our daily bread. Now this is something we take for granted nowadays, as most of us have adequate food to eat. Full refrigerators, or grocery stores that's waiting to help us fill them up anytime we get ready. But don't be fooled. There are many of us out here who are struggling for food every day and are having to depend on the Father answering this part of our prayers in order to eat every day. We're looking here in chapter 62 of the Third Testament of the Bible. Verse 29 says, I have withheld your daily bread to prove that he who has faith is like the birds that do not worry about tomorrow. So there are some that's on this spiritual walk who are suffering hunger. But if what I understand about the scripture is to be true, we will all suffer hunger one day. That's part of the tribulation that all of us have to go through. Famines are a part of it. And if you look closely, you can see the food shortages on the horizon already. So although we take our daily bread for granted these days, we better learn to incorporate that into our prayer so that when the Walmart trucks stop running, we will all know where to turn in order to get that daily sustenance. But let's go on. Verse 4 says, And forgive us of our sins. And we find out in the book of James chapter 2 and verse 9 that sin is the transgression of the law. So in this part of the prayer we learn from the Messiah that we are to ask for forgiveness of those sins. But look what he says next. For we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. This is extremely important for us to understand. If we want our sins to be forgiven, if we want those things that we have done in error and in, and in offense to our Father to be forgiven, 
we have to forgive those that are offending us. We can't hold people guilty of doing something to harm us and then turn around and expect the Father to forgive us for what we have done wrong. So this part is added to our prayer in order to remind us that this is what has to take place if we are expecting our transgressions to be forgiven. Then let's look at this part here. He says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This too is an extremely important part of our prayers. We have to remember that we are fighting against principalities and powers. And these powers, sometimes called passions, are really trying to harm us. But what are they doing? They are leading us into temptation, putting us in a position where we will actually harm ourselves. They can't really make us do stuff. But they can make it real easy for us to choose to do bad stuff. So what we're asking for in this part of our prayer is that those tempters can't get at us. We're asking that those malicious spirits don't have the opportunity to put us in positions that we can do harm to ourselves and to others. We're asking to be delivered from evil. You've heard me mention several times that we are to have silent prayers. But thanks to a little pushback from a commenter named Jenny, I was forced to go in and find some of the verses from where that teaching comes from. One in particular is over here in verse 15 of chapter 17. It's talking about how men do not pray, how the majority of the people don't bother to pray at all. And it says, and when they try to do it, instead of speaking to me with the spirit, they do it with their lips, employing useless words, rituals, and material idols. So unless we're praying in a room where others need to hear, our prayer should be silent, spirit to spirit communication. Remember that our Father is a spiritual being. There's no need to talk to Him out loud. Again, unless we're in a place where others need to hear the prayer. But if you think about it, that's where the moment of silence comes from. In that moment of quietness, the people are expected to have spirit to spirit communication with the Father in heaven. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close this video out. If you got something out of it, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the dislike button. But leave us a comment either way. And if you haven't done so already, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and or that bell button so you can see when new classes come out. May our Father bless you and keep you. May our Father make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Father lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.